Tonight, a skate on the Rideau River ends in tragedy. We are all screaming. It's really hard. We can't describe it. Two lives lost after four teenagers fall through the ice. Striking a deal to get students back in school. Our kids have been home for six weeks and we're losing our minds. When classrooms might reopen across Quebec. And at issue answers your questions. What would the implications of a second Donald Trump presidency be for Canada? Rosie and the panel break down the biggest political obstacles heading into the new year. This is The National with Ian Hennemansing. We begin with breaking news. Ottawa police say the body of a second teen who went through the ice of the Rideau River has been recovered tonight. One of two boys who died. 17-year-old Ahmed Ahmed was the first. The pair were with other friends when they went under the ice, prompting a day-long rescue effort. The pair is with two other teens who also fell into the Rideau, but they made it out. Nicole Williams now with the community's shock and grief. A long, desperate and difficult search. Police divers spent the day scouring the frigid waters of the Rideau River for the body of a missing teenage boy. He and three friends came here around 9 o'clock Wednesday night to go skating and fell through the ice. Two were able to climb out and call for help. Another, 17-year-old Ahmed Ahmed, was found dead hours later. We are all screaming, actually. It's really hard. It's really hard. We can't describe it, really. This is the worst feeling ever. Really, we can't do nothing. Just we can't do nothing. His family didn't want to speak on camera, but they say Ahmed was the youngest of four. He loved sports and wanted to be a police officer. He's very friendly with everybody. He helped his brother. Even his brother was crying. He said, even when I'm thirsty, I call him. He's downstairs. I call him, bring me water, and he come right away. He and his family came to Canada 10 years ago as refugees. As police gathered at the scene, his friends arrived with a candle to honor him. I know I speak for our community when we send our thoughts and condolences out to the families of the victims. And certainly this is an opportunity to hug the ones we love a little tighter tonight. The two teens who escaped the water were treated in hospital for mild hypothermia. These locks in a rural area of Ottawa's south end are a popular skating spot. But this year, the ice is very thin. With the warm weather, it's been hard. There's not much ice being made. So if you try to step on it, you're going to likely break through right now. And Nicole, this has been a, a major search effort. That's right. Search crews were here since early this morning, including police and divers, and they stayed well past sunset, setting up big lights so that they could continue to see as they combed the waters. And others have stopped by here, too, as you saw, including those two friends of Ahmed who didn't feel like speaking to us on camera. But tonight, Ian, they are remembering him as a kind and helpful friend, and they say they are devastated. Nicole Williams in Manatick, just south of Ottawa. And this tragedy comes after two others in the last week, both in Alberta, a family of three falling through ice around Christmas time, then a Calgary man did as well on Christmas Day. Ithil Musa with the risks and how to stay safe. It may look strong and sturdy, but experts warn. Ice can be very deceiving. If you've got, you know, lakes, rivers, anything with a lot of movement in it, it's unlikely to freeze solid. At least eight Canadians have died after falling through ice since November. Experts say climate change is shortening the period of time lakes are frozen. And this year, El Nino is keeping the water warmer. We are a country of, of snow, ice and cold. And uh, what's missing uh, is, uh, is all of the above. We're seeing a lot more rain, for example, not as much snow. Experts say conditions are most dangerous at the beginning and end of winter. And everyone needs to take precautions when they go near ice. The season is narrower and narrower to enjoy activities on the ice. So people really do need to keep that in mind. You know, if you have a tradition of going out in January for ice fishing, um, don't assume that over the decades that will remain the time of year that is most appropriate to go. According to the Life Saving Society, approximately 35% of drownings in Canada occur from October to April, and snowmobiling and ice accidents account for most of them.
wear a life jacket before you venture out on the ice, even if you're just going out to check the depth of the ice, putting a life jacket on or a buoyant snowsuit on is a great layer of protection. Bacalar also says it's important to have someone else with you and to let others know where you're going before heading out on the ice. Idil Moussa, CBC News, Toronto. After more than a month at home, Quebec students might finally be returning to school in the coming weeks. That after two tentative agreements, they could get teachers and support staff back into classrooms. But as Quabina Oduro explains, despite mounting pressure, it is not a done deal. Go for it. After more than a month of a province-wide strike, the prospect of heading back to school is storing up excitement for some in Quebec. For the first like week or two, it's been like okay, but then after that, it was like very like boring, and like we had nothing really to do. The potential return now more likely with a proposed deal between the province and a major teachers' union. The details not yet released, but a focus on working conditions and salary were both top of mind. I wish it's going to be uh, a good news for us because it's really, as you said, it's a really, really long strike. And in a separate agreement, the province reached a tentative deal with a labor alliance that represents hundreds of thousands of public sector workers, including school support staff, who must be back in the classroom for schools to reopen. The government negotiators could have settled this a long time ago without getting to the point that we've gotten if they had actually agreed to listen to workers' uh, proposals. The workers did not want to go on strike. Back outside Notre Dame de Grasse Elementary School, this mother says it isn't easy having her children home all the time. And now she worries about the toll this time off may have taken. My youngest is in grade one, so she's just learning how to read. We've seen her slide back in that in that you know zone. Um, my eldest is in grade five. Grade five is a super important year for um, like high school admissions and marks. Despite those concerns, Jennifer Zimmerman says she supports the teachers. We feel so indebted to our teachers. They have one of the most difficult jobs in the world. Um, you know, case in point, our kids have been home for six weeks and we're losing our minds. Um, so we're so thankful for our teachers. Corbina, now that we have these proposed deals, what's next? Well, Ian, they are being presented to union leadership. Now, if endorsed, they'll be recommended to its members who will vote on it after the holidays. Now, in a statement, Quebec Treasury Board President says the details will remain confidential until the vote takes place. And as you can imagine, Quebec parents will be watching for any news as to when this extended break will end. I'll bet. Quibino Duro reporting from Montreal tonight. Twelve weeks after she disappeared during Hamas's deadly attack, news of the Canadian-Israeli peace activist Judy Weinstein died on that day. Julie Wong has more on what's believed to have happened and the growing offensive inside Gaza right now. After months of uncertainty, confirmation a Canadian-Israeli woman is dead. A mother of four and a grandmother of seven, the near Rose kibbutz now says Judy Weinstein was killed on October 7th, the day Hamas attacked Israel. Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie has issued a statement saying, Canada mourns her loss with her family and loved ones. Her daughter spoke to CBC News before her death was confirmed. She was such a peace activist and all she wanted is to help. You know, she was an English teacher for years. Are you married? Weinstein shot this video while walking with her husband just before Hamas militants stormed her kibbutz. Weinstein was shot and her family believed she was taken hostage. Her husband, Gad Hagi's death, was confirmed a week ago. The kibbutz believes both their bodies remain in Gaza, held by Hamas. Her daughter previously said waiting for news had been difficult. You know, your mind kind of fills the gap. It's, honestly, it's torture, really. Israel says 129 hostages remain in Gaza and warns its bombardment won't stop until two conditions are met. We will continue to explore every avenue to secure our hostages' release and the dismantling of this terrorist regime. In southern Gaza, the air inside this hospital Thursday is thick with despair as casualties of an Israeli airstrike are rushed in. The Hamas-run health ministry says 20 Palestinians were killed. We were sitting and eating when we found something falling over our heads, this child says. 
Israel also hit a refugee camp as it intensified attacks in central Gaza. The Israeli military maintains it regrets the harm done to civilians, but stresses it's targeting Hamas. They bombed the school, but we didn't leave here as we don't have anywhere to go, said this man. And there's no clear timeline on when or if that could change. Egypt says it has put forward a plan for some type of ceasefire, but has not heard back from either side. Julia Wong, CBC News, London. And fighting between Hezbollah and Israel is ramping up along the country's northern border with Lebanon. Explosions have been rocking the mountains. That has come with renewed warnings from Israel, saying it's willing to deploy more resources if incoming strikes continue to intensify. Adding today, the time for diplomatic solutions is running out. Some developing news tonight. Maine has disqualified Donald Trump from running for president in that state. Tanya Fletcher now with the reason, the Trump team's response, and the impact this could have on the U.S. election. It's another big blow to Donald Trump's bid to return to the White House. Maine now becoming the second state to disqualify him from primary ballots. The state's top election official citing his actions up to and during the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol, saying, quote, The weight of the evidence makes clear that Mr. Trump was aware of the tinder laid by his multi-month effort to delegitimize a Democratic election and then chose to light a match. This after an emboldened former president went after Colorado's top court for also wiping his name from that state's ballot. Nobody can understand why they did that. I guess maybe they did it for publicity. Maybe they did it for the very liberal, radical left governor. The decisions by Colorado and Maine have created a legal patchwork that could be left in the hands of the highest court in the country. Right now, uh, we have different results from different states. I think the Supreme Court's going to be concerned about that. While Maine and Colorado have disqualified Trump, five states, including most recently Michigan, have dismissed attempts to remove his name from the ballot. But there are still more than a dozen other states reviewing these types of challenges. All of the court fodder has blown the door wide open for political pandering. Maybe we should take Joe Biden off the ballot in Texas for allowing 8 million people to cross the border since he's been president. It's kind of a mess. The courts, this the professor says it seems inevitable that the U.S. Been. Supreme Court will weigh in, which could happen by early 2024. I think the court has to say that, look, as a nation, we have to figure out how we want to govern ourselves and the rules of that governance. Uh, if it's going to be a hodgepodge, then it's, it's just going to be even more fractured than it already is. So, Tanya, how might this play out for Trump over the next few weeks? Well, Ian, with Republicans appealing the Colorado decision, Trump's name will appear on the ballot there. That is, unless the U.S. Supreme Court agrees he should be disqualified or refuses to take the case altogether. Now, as for Maine, challengers have five days to file an appeal. The Trump campaign issued a statement late tonight saying they will. Once that happens, the ruling to keep Trump off the ballot in that state will be paused while it makes its way through a Maine state court. Ian? Tanya Fletcher reporting from Washington, D.C. tonight. Pacific storms are causing treacherous conditions along California's coast. There is concern that waves between 10 and 20 meters could breach seawalls and damage piers. Residents are being advised to stay away from the water. Some coastal roads already flooded and covered with debris. Several evacuation orders are in effect tonight. And here's the damage near Manchester, England, after police say a tornado hit Wednesday. It was part of Storm Garrett, which slammed into parts of England and Scotland, bringing high winds, heavy rains and snow. That shut down a major route through the Scottish Highlands for hours. And flooding hit the community north of Edinburgh. Power was cut to thousands and travel also affected. I agree with him. Imagine being on this plane arriving at London's Heathrow Airport as it came in yesterday during a windstorm. Train service also suspended in areas that left a lot of travelers stranded. And it was more than a bumpy ride for 10 airplane passengers now safely back in Yellowknife tonight after a hard landing forced them to spend the night in the frozen subarctic. Juanita Taylor now on the dramatic rescue operation that spanned multiple provinces. 
about 24 hours after going down in an airplane onto a frozen lake and sleeping in heated tents last night. Eight passengers and two crew members will have quite the story to tell now that they are back in Yellowknife and receiving treatment. The Air Tindy Twin Otter went down about 300 kilometres northeast of Yellowknife on Wednesday near the Divic Diamond Mine. The Joint Rescue Coordination Centre Trenton started the search and rescue operation shortly after with a Hercules aircraft deployed from Winnipeg. Despite high winds and low visibility, two search and rescue technicians were able to parachute down to the stranded passengers and crew with life-saving equipment and supplies until they could be rescued. That came at daylight light Thursday with improved weather conditions. Rescue teams picked up the stranded people and took them to a nearby airfield where medevac planes were waiting. Two were seriously hurt, six are being treated for minor injuries, while two are uninjured. Air Tindy's president says the cause of the accident is still unknown. We don't know. Um, it was a ski aircraft that's pretty normal in the Northwest Territories. We don't have a lot of airports or runways, so uh, air aircraft will take off on skis and land on a frozen lake. It was a private charter, um, at, but we don't know the conditions. We know that the aircraft had its accident right at the side where it was intending to land. And we know that right afterwards that it was uh, very windy with reduced visibility. Canadian forces are expected to release more details tomorrow. The Transportation Safety Board will be investigating the incident. Air Tindy says it too will be launching its own investigation to find out what happened and how to prevent it from happening again. Juanita Taylor, CBC News, Rankin Inlet, Nunavut. Vinyl records are surging in sales and more artists are looking for a sustainable solution. Duh. The colorful approach to turn vinyl green. This was a thousand albums, a thousand dreams. The familiar faces getting one of Canada's highest honors. When you lost in grade eight, I was just like, oh. Did you cry when you watched it back? And remembering the moment a man parked a plane in his yard. Come on in. We're back in two. Slicing his way right through that Knicks defense this time. It was a very good year for basketball star Shea Gilgis Alexander, and now another honor to cap off 2023. He's been named the Canadian Press Male Athlete of the Year. The 25 year old had a breakout season in the NBA and led Canada to its first ever men's basketball World Cup medal. It's Macintosh! Macintosh! Gold in 20406! Another world junior record! And Summer McIntosh also made a big splash in 2023. The swimming sensation has been named the Canadian Press Female Athlete of the Year. The Toronto team won a pair of world championship gold medals and set two world records, all before her 17th birthday. And next year could be even bigger when she chases her first Olympic medal in Paris. Governor General Mary Simon has announced 78 new appointees to the Order of Canada, including one of Canada's best interviewers. For 10 seasons on CBC TV, George Strombolopoulos interviewed Hollywood A-listers, political heavyweights, and superstar athletes. The popular media figure and UN World Food Program ambassador joins the Order of Canada with 77 others including political cartoonist Michael DeAdder, Suzanne Craig, a Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist who helped expose Donald Trump's finances, and Willie Adams, Canada's first Innu senator. Final records are making a comeback with artists like Taylor Swift and Drake helping drive sales. But there is concern about the environmental impact of vinyl production. As Tom Perry shows us, that has a Canadian company trying to change the industry by going green and their work is getting noticed by one of the biggest names in music. The rebirth of vinyl in full swing. Workers at this plant near Toronto turning out LPs in every color of the rainbow for artists around the world. Demand for records and their rich, warm sound has been growing for years, along with questions about how they're made. PVC is the compound we're using, polyvinyl chloride. So we should care about that. 
polyvinyl chloride is a petroleum product, meaning every record has a carbon footprint. At this plant, the goal is to shrink that by making sure as little vinyl as possible goes to waste. So the Ecomix program is designed to recycle everything we make. Records that don't make the cut are sorted by color, ground up and used again in what the company calls Ecomix. This was a, th a thousand albums, a thousand dreams, right? It's not unusual for record companies to recycle reject LPs. The difference here is the color. The company offers six distinct shades. So the industry has had a recycled vinyl product for some time. And what that is, is it's a grab bag of random reground colors thrown together into a surprise color, right? And sometimes it looks okay. Sometimes it has a bit of a baby vomit look, you know? There's a lot of bands that just use this as their rehearsal space. Josh Wickens runs a record label out of a dark restaurant basement, but has embraced the bright new colors. It's got a lot of different hues and colors and, you know, different highlights. His latest release on Ecomix from Toronto hardcore band Street Justice. It's pretty much my go-to when I do vinyl. For any band, really, I'll offer it and hope that they, they accept. Duh. It's not just indie bands. Pop star Billie Eilish has announced a project on Ecomix, though some say what's needed is to replace vinyl altogether with something cleaner and greener. For now, the focus here is on cutting waste while pressing ahead with the vinyl revival. Tom Perry, CBC News, Burlington, Ontario. After a year of political disputes and division, Canadians have some questions. My question for the At Issue panel is... From fake news to climate change, Rosie and the At Issue panel take on your concerns. Um, it's become a wedge issue. But first, a Canadian company finds new hope against superbugs. They already do a job, and that job is killing bacteria on our body. The National breaks down the story shaping our world. Next. More than 100,000 blenders are being recalled in Canada over safety concerns. Health Canada says the BlendJet 2 can overheat and catch fire and the blades can break off. It adds that affected owners should immediately stop using the blenders and return them to the company for a free replacement. If you own one, you can find out if it's being recalled by visiting the company's website. A team of researchers in Winnipeg may be at the forefront of fighting a major global health issue, antibiotic resistance. Karen Pauls looks at how the lab is using viruses to fight superbugs. Those clearings are where you can actually see that the phages, the viruses, have basically consumed the bacteria. These Winnipeg scientists have developed a cocktail of viruses that kills E. coli and salmonella in chickens. And this is the way that we can tell how, how strong the bacteria phage is against the bacteria. They believe their product could also be adapted to treat people who have infections caused by drug-resistant superbugs. They already do a job, and that job is killing bacteria on our body. Phages are viruses that only infect bacteria. They work by binding themselves to a cell, injecting their genetic information inside, creating more of themselves until they burst out, looking for more hosts to kill. It's very uh, keyed into actually killing bacterial infections only. Doesn't infect human cells, doesn't infect animal cells, and you probably have about 100 trillion of them all over you right now. Stephen Terrio's research found the survival rate of chickens infected with E. coli and then given farm phage was 92%, compared to 8% of untreated birds. Our birds are healthier, so when they had a, a flu come through the actual barns, our, our chickens actually survived a lot more better or a lot better than the actual barn that was the control barn. If the bacteriophage can replace antibiotics in chickens, Terrio believes they are an answer to antibiotic resistance in humans too. The World Health Organization says it's a global threat associated with millions of deaths every year. According to the WHO, antimicrobial resistant diseases will increase at least 300 fold by 2050. They're gonna be dying in the hospitals because there's no treatments. 
we can actually treat those diseases by using a virus. Any new therapeutic product has to be authorized for use in animals and humans. Farmphage has been approved in Bangladesh and it's currently going through the process in the U.S. Industry groups are lobbying for changes to Canada's regulatory system so bacteriophages can be submitted for approval here too. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Winnipeg. Now let's break down the news shaping our world. Rosie is here with a special year-end at issue. At issue this week, your political questions. My question for the at issue panel is this. My question for the at issue panel is. My question for the at issue panel is. This is my question for the at issue panel. Hi there, I'm Rosemary Barton. Thank you all for sending in all these great questions for the Ad Issue panel. Not all of you made the cut, but we still appreciate you sending them in. With me tonight for our last panel of 2023, Chantal Hébert, Andrew Coyne, Althea Raj, good to see you all in person. Uh, also, it, I can't believe it's the end. We're moving in, we're moving into the next year. Not the end of the panel, the end of the year. <laughs> what are you it's to like, say? why are you an answer? <laughs> That's what I'm telling you, okay. Let's move on. Our first question from Adam in Vancouver. Our question to the Ad Issue panel is, who is the most honest politician we've seen this past year? And how can we bring truth and honesty back to Canadian politics? Don't all jump to answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, it's my assumption yes. that most of the politicians I cover try to be honest. Yes, I would agree. Uh, and I do not rate them on the most and the least honest because I have no way to judge that. But I do start from the assumption that uh, most of them are in it uh, for what they believe is the public good. Yes. Uh, and they try to go about their job as honestly as possible. That does not mean that they don't sometimes skirt uh, the truth with spin. But that has been part and parcel of what's been happening in politics for decades. But yes. I, I can't... I, I, I'm not going to do a, an honesty no. sweepstake. No, and I wouldn't either. But I would say there's a difference between spin and misinformation, which is something that we're seeing more of, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe one's worse. I, I'm a little less inclined to let them off the hook. Uh, uh, <laughs> of course you are. Not, not outright lying. Okay, fine. Uh, but yeah, Blarney spin, selective use of the facts uh, is part and parcel of the trade. Uh, maybe it's necessary, maybe it's, it was ever thus, but we should always be alert that that's in fact what's going on. The same with advertising. Advertising sure. is always false in some way, shape, or form. Uh, I do think, however, that, that politicians who acquire a, a reputation for being straighter shooters than the other, uh, they get something in the bank. They get capital in their name mm -hmm. that is useful and helpful to you. Despite yep. being the right thing to do. Yep. And I wish more of them understood that playing the long game uh, being the skill player rather than the goon uh, will advance their careers a lot better than, than always going for the short-term takedown or the, or the quick, convenient lie. But all yeah, parties yeah. have those people. That's sure, right. They're, sure. they're yeah. not the exception. No, yeah. no. Althea. I thought Adam, if I remember his name correctly, his question was really interesting. Um, but we cannot answer it honestly yeah. because, well, first <coughs> of all, I feel like that would be asking me to out my sources. Obviously, like Chantal, <laughs> uh -huh. I, I talk to people that I have developed a relationship with that I trust. Yeah. And there is a lot of those people on Parliament Hill in all political parties. Yeah. But it is also true that I think we've seen a lot of lies coming out of Pierre Polio's mouth. We have seen a lot of lies come out of Justin Trudeau's mouth. And I don't know if there's an increase, but I think there is a, a people are more casual, it seems, about lying than they used to be, and they, they lie without shame. And that also applies to political staffers. And that makes our jobs more difficult, but it also creates this huge distress mm. where you doubt the validity of the information that is given to you, and you will never trust that person again. Once that is broken, that's broken forever. And so if that, you know, that MP has a career that lasts 15 years, we will all remember that that person yep, lied. Yep. Okay. Teresa, Woodstock, New Brunswick. My question for the At Issue panel is, with Meta continuing to ban Canadian news on their platform, I want to know what you think is the best way that journalists and news organizations can battle the ever-growing fake news landscape. Okay, who wants to talk about the fake news landscape from Teresa? <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, I think the first thing we could do is not take government money. Uh, all due respect to the CBC, but those of us on the print side of things never had before. And among the many reasons I have complaint with it is it has been an absolute gift to people who want to say, oh, you all media yes. people are all on the take, you're just sure. in Justin Trudeau's pocket, et cetera. Beyond that, uh, um, you know, model the, the opposite. You know, be as, as truthful, give people reliable information. Uh, now more than ever, people are looking for news sources they can trust. And it, uh, it really, you know, accentuates the premium uh, for, for providing that to them. It's hard to come with a different recipe, but I, like Andrew, I don't believe government intervention makes things uh, better, possibly because, uh, and that has not happened with Bill C-18, I should say that outright, but I have never covered the prime minister who didn't want to have more leverage with the media. <laughs> uh, and the more news organizations are dependent on the government, regardless of, of partisan stripe, the more... It's, it's not us that gets the pressure. It happens in boardrooms uh, where people yes. worry about bottom lines, which matter to getting journalists sure. paid, but you're putting yourself at the mercy of people who have an interest in having leverage. So a few things. Um, I'm not entirely convinced the government doesn't have a role, only because, frankly, I don't know if the media can survive without having, whether it's a journalism labor tax credit. Like, we've had help for different forms of media forever, like magazines had a printing, um, a postal subsidy. So there are different ways, I think, of structuring that that takes it away from the hand of the government. But I think that's a different conversation. For me, the fake news landscape is not really our job to counter that. Like, I worry that people cannot distinguish on their no own what is a real news story and what is a fake news story. And I hope that in school, children are being taught how to distinguish between the two. And I worry about, you know, we're entering this era of artificial intelligence, of deep fakes. Yeah. How do we have trusted sources of news that are funded enough to cover real political stories in a way that we want to see them covered? I don't know, but I don't think that's our responsibility alone as journalists. I think all like society as a whole, parents, yeah. teachers. Yeah. 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 Just to pick up on that point, the problem of disinformation is not just one of su the supply, it's the demand. It's that there's a large constituency of people out there who prefer the fantasy to the reality, and that's a much more deep-seated problem for society to deal with. Okay, let's go to Barry, thank you for all that. Let's go to Barry Ruger in Nova Scotia. My question for the ad issue panel is this. Here in Nova Scotia, we've had floods, we've had fires, we've had hurricanes, and everybody around here knows that it's tied to global warming and climate change. Why on earth can't the federal government stand up to the oil companies and actually bring in some serious regulation to lower emissions? Althea, you want to show that one? It takes way too long for the government to bring in uh, regulations of all types. It took about six years for the clean fuel regulations to get done. Um, this environment minister, when he came in, talked about that being a challenge. <clears throat> there are a few reasons why. Um, I asked even Gibo, we have a podcast in every two weeks, we have an, an episode and in November I sat down with him and I basically asked the same question. And, and I phrased it as, you know, in COVID, we saw sure. you, all, all hands approach, we saw things move very quickly. If you really think climate is a catastrophe, why aren't you treating it mm -hmm. as such? And he said, well, one thing, not as many Canadians believe that climate change is a catastrophe as much as people thought COVID was a catastrophe. And that doesn't just mean that people are not necessarily on side, but you don't have provincial governments, municipal governments, business leaders attacking the problem the same way. You also can't flip a switch. Like it, Canada relies on oil and gas, for it, not only to function, but economically. It, that can't be done as quickly maybe as Barry would like to see but it. But it's not just that. We, we live in a federation where there are constitutional responsibilities to provinces and to the federal government. Yeah. Uh, Stephen Gilbo recently brought in uh, a plan to have a, a cap on emissions. Mm -hmm. Well, the provinces that are in buying into that, Alberta, Saskatchewan, at this point in the political cycle, are going to wait out the Liberals. They may be more amenable to having that conversation if the Liberals <laughs> win another election. Mm -hmm. And that brings me back to a fundamental problem that we have with this debate. Um, it's become a wedge issue. 
Yes. And parties are using it in that fashion. So you never work towards a consensus. Instead of having an opposition party say, elect me because I'm going to do better on yes. climate yes. change, yes. you have a party that says I'm going to do more or I'm going to do less. Now, me, I wish that we went down the road that we went with NAFTA. Mm. There was a lot of opposition to NAFTA at first. Two of the main parties were against it. Big provinces opposed it. But eventually, all parties decided to make it work. And it led to the renegotiation of NAFTA under Donald Trump. Until we get there to a constant sensual basis between the main political forces in this country, we're not going to move forward. We're going to go one step forward, one step back. Last word to you. I'm not sure I agree with the premise of the question. It seems to me they've singled out their oil and gas industry. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is only one industry among many that is responsible for carbon emissions, uh, albeit an important one. But they've had, you know, this, the, the oil and gas cap, the, the legislation on making it virtually impossible to build pipelines, the legislation on uh, tank shipping oil by tanker. Uh, uh, all of these things, and, and most of these things, or at least certainly the oil and gas cap itself, is not just corrosive of national unity, it's bad policy. The smart policy, every economist, every analyst looks at this would say is carbon pricing. The regulatory and subsidy thing costs anywhere from five to 16 times as much. And at a time when our economy is growing so slowly as it is and likely to continue to grow, um, we need to be really focused on achieving our climate goals at the cheapest possible way, and we're not okay. doing that. Okay, we're going to leave this here. Take a quick break. We'll be back with more of your questions, including this one. What would the implications of a second Donald Trump presidency be for Canada and more broadly, the rules-based international order? That answer and more at issue coming up. Hey, welcome back. I'm Rosemary Barton. We're answering some of your political questions to wrap up the year. Chantal, Andrew, and Althea all here with me in person. And now here's a question from Tristan in Unionville, Ontario. This is my question for the At Issue panel. New Brunswick and Saskatchewan dismantled policies that protect trans and gender diverse youth. Saskatchewan going as far as using the notwithstanding clause. It seems as though anti-LGBTQ2 plus rhetoric that has been rising across the country has made its way into our politics. Do you agree? And if so, why is it going unchallenged? Okay, so this is something I think we talked about through the year because it did come up a couple of times in different provinces. Um, I'm not sure it's going unchallenged, but what, why do you think it's become an issue? Andrew. Uh, it, partly because it's new. I mean, the, the explosion of interest and in, in concern and controversy around trans issues is relatively new. You know, I'm not sure I would agree that in general LGBTQ, you know, there's an anti uh, mood in the land. If you look at where we've gone on gay and lesbian rights, for example, it's extraordinary. Uh, um, so this is the new thing that people, are, some people are worried about. Uh, most people, I think, are pretty well disposed to trans people generally. There are these specific carve-out issues, which is why the people who are trying to exploit this focus on these things about, you know, participation in team sports or, or notification of parents. Yeah. And I just think it's exploiting people's unease with a thing that they haven't really had to grapple with much until now. Yeah, well, there are, there are the conservative parties in provinces seem to be making it about parental rights as opposed to the rights of, of trans people. Yes, it's the next frontier for, for the religious right, yes. uh, which has had few victories in this country. Mm. But I am always reminded when I see something new, uh, and, and the words conservatives, uh, it wasn't that long ago that there was a vote in the House of Commons that the Liberals participated in under Jean Chrétien to say that marriage should only be between a man and a woman. So uh, politicians have, have been playing with their own unease on some of yes. those issues sure. over the years yes. to eventually end up uh, in the mainstream flow. So it's not as if the issue is clear-cut no, 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 everyone no. on one side no. uh, and the majority saying let's let's intervene and in all this it's more complicated than that Althea? yeah I agree with everything that's been said I think part of the reason is politicians are exploiting people's fear mostly fear of the unknown uh, which is usually the case when it comes to uh, cultural rights immigrant issues um, I think it's popular for some because you know, good parents want, can't understand why, you know, if my daughter Jessica wants to be called Jonathan at school, well, I, I would want to know about that. Um, and, and so 
I, I, I don't necessarily think it comes from a bad place for so many people who support this. It's just being very uncomfortable with change. And there's been a lot of change and people are very anxious about a lot of things. And politicians are, are playing on people's fears by choosing issues that wedge them like this. Mm -hmm. And they're not thinking about the consequences on the people who are most vulnerable. Yeah, and perhaps not being honest about the, the, the actual issue. The reason yeah, why yeah, they're yeah, doing yeah, it. That's right. Okay, a uh, question from Louis in Dunrobin, Ontario. My question for the at issue panel is, what would the implications of a second Donald Trump presidency be for Canada and more broadly, the rules-based international order? Thank you. It's a great question, and Louis looks very Canadian there in uh, <laughs> Ontario. This is something that people are thinking about, politicians are thinking about, um, and perhaps preparing for. Chantal? The short answer is we don't know, but we don't think that there would be uh, anything good that could come of it. This isn't a government that uh, would be coming to, to, to the White House with a, a change agenda to rethink the international world order. Uh, this is more of an administration that would be looking at it and saying, um, I'm going to just kick it down. I, I don't really give Pretty a chaos, damn. Yeah. The same is true about the rule of law. It's quite unique uh, in history. I'm not so sure that because it's, it's a unique experiment, we really want to live through it. Uh, it's huge and potentially calamitous. Um, we always, I think, fail to grasp the enormity of Trump, mm -hmm. how completely disordered uh, he is as a person in every conceivable way. And so this would not be an, uh, an administration, even like the last administration, where he, the last Trump administration, where he at least had some people there who were trying to rein him in and constrain mm -hmm. him. This administration would be filled with the lowest of the low, the, the worst, most sycophantic flunkies, the people who are the most radical revolutionaries, including people who are open and, and advocating dictatorship for America. It would be consumed with trying to get retribution on his enemies, using the Department of Justice to do so, trying to evade the criminal charges that he's facing, using the elements of state to do that. Uh, and he's t very clearly talked about pulling out of NATO. So uh, at home and abroad, it's, it's, it, will be, it will consume us all. It will be the, if he gets in, will be the single big, biggest issue in the world. Worse than the first time, it sounds like. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 yeah, I think we all agree with that. If Mr. Trump wins, um, I think domestically we will try to get out of the way, basically. But what that means is there is so much of the Canada-U.S. relationship that happens like underneath the political level, but all that might be affected, basically might grind to a halt. Then there's obviously the impact on our national defense. I think the conversation in Canada would be that we need to spend more money. Uh, and then internationally, what it means for our military alliances. Okay, Louis. In. <laughs> there you go. We've left you with that answer. Maybe not how you wanted to end the year and think about the new year, but uh, thank you all for that. And Happy New Year. We'll see you back here in 2024. I have to end it That's like that. That's not very optimistic. Know, but <laughs> you can still have a great year ahead. And I'll throw things back to the Nationals. All right, thanks, Rosie. Next, one man parks his plane in an unlikely spot. People ask me why, why somebody would put a giant airplane on their property. Why indeed, he'll have the answer in our Moment Countdown. Our countdown towards the best moment of the year is nearing the top. Tonight, number four, one man's love for planes reaches new heights. Hey there, I'm Jesse Millington, and that is my aircraft, the Fokker F-28. Come on in. This is all in here from, uh, from back when she flew. People ask me why why somebody would put a giant airplane on their property. And uh, my response is always, you know, because they said, they said you couldn't or it couldn't be done. And nobody had ever moved an F-28, uh, especially taken it apart with the landing gear on and moved it like 900 kilometers over a province and a half. How are they all transported then? How do you transport them? Uh, like I said in one of my comments, magic and big cranes. What do your neighbors think? What do people think when they drive by and they see these here? It seems to have been a very good reception. Um, I have a lot of them stopping, so I usually invite them over and say, hey, come on down, and if I got the ladder free, I'll say, hey, let's go inside or something like that. And to me, you know, my, my dedication is to anybody that comes out and sees the aircraft, you know, and takes something away from it. 
it is kind of cool. But what about the neighbors? He says that uh, there's some trees that kind of block the view and that, and I think this is a quote, his neighbors have the same level of craziness as he does. So it's okay. Thanks for being with us. You can watch anytime, anywhere on the free CBC News app and subscribe to the Nationals' YouTube channel. I'm Ian Hanna-Mansing in Vancouver. See you tomorrow night.